Hello and good evening. It's 8 p.m. UK time. So as you know, it is time to start our live event and we have another special guest and another interesting topic to discuss today. So welcome back everyone to, and I'm very happy that you have decided to join us tonight as well. And as you can see, we already, as I've mentioned, have a special guest here and this is Dr. Alpes. And how are you feeling, Dr. Alpes, tonight? I'm very well, thank you, Caroline. It's always a pleasure to lecture on the platform and, of course, talk about very interesting topics in uh, reproductive medicine. So I'm excited. Thank you so much. And we are definitely happy to have you back with us once again, as this is our second edition of Stronger Together. So once again, huge thank you for supporting this initiative and joining us once again. And as always, just let me remind you that, of course, all those Stronger Together events have been brought to you thanks to our ambassadors and partners. So let me thank them. And as you can see, they are right here on the screen. And as always, I want to thank them for their support throughout this second edition of Stronger Together events as well. And as you can see, uh, there is another interesting topic that we have brought to you today, and it is the importance of the embryology lab in optimizing success rates. So, of course, we will start with Dr. Alpes' um, presentation that he has prepared for you, and then it will be time for your questions. So, all you need to do is just type those questions in the chat section so that uh, he can help you out a bit. And of course, let me just remind you that uh, Dr. Alpes Doshi is a clinical embryologist and co-founder of IVF London. So, hello to uh, London, and uh, as I mentioned, we are definitely definitely excited to hear what you have prepared for us tonight and once again thank you so much for joining and as always i'm your host caroline and please let us know that you can hear us loud and clear so we can go ahead with the presentation okay and well dr alpash are you ready to begin I'm here, certainly thank you all right well thank you so much everyone thank you caroline for the invitation again to join ivf uh, media or stronger together initiative i am going to be talking about um, some various important topics today one of them which is very close to my heart and something that i do in my day-to-day -day life which is clinical embryology so um i will just slide it yeah so i'm going to be talking about the importance of the embryology laboratory in optimizing success rates so many of you who may have either been through ivf or are considering IVF, it is very important to understand that the success rates are um, in a double pronged fashion. So we have the clinical success rates. So your clinician is very important. At the same time, you want to make sure that the embryology laboratory is also generating very optimum success rates. Now, it is always the clinician or the doctor and the embryologist together that give the outcomes of good success rate in an IVF clinic. So today I'm going to be talking a bit about the various aspects of the embryology lab that you may or may not know about that actually do have an impact in success rates. So um, as Caroline introduced me, my name is Alpesh Doshi. I'm a consultant embryologist and co-founder at IVF London. I have uh, quite a bit of experience in clinical embryology and I started the clinic here at Ivy of London in 2018, which is very much a scientifically led clinic with a great emphasis on embryology practices. I'm also an honorary consultant at Guys in St. Thomas Hospital in London, uh, where I um, you know, uh, see patients for severe male factor infertility or Klinefelter syndrome. So, one of the classic things in assisted conception is individualized patient care. Now, when clinics talk about individualized care, it doesn't necessarily only have to mean clinically, also embryologically, the treatment pathway can be very personalized. So one of the main areas of optimizing patient outcomes is by individualizing their treatment journey or their patient care. Now, this, as I said, also goes um, in, in, in line with what we do in the laboratory. It's not just necessarily the drugs that we give the patient, 
the stimulation that we give the patient, but even what do we do within the lab, which actually gives them a very bespoke journey. And we do not treat them as a one size fits all because every patient is very, very different. So one of the ways in which we do this is by very carefully monitoring the development of the embryo and selecting the right embryo for that patient. So again, uh, it must be said that embryo selection is again very patient centric as well. We look at the embryos very individually based on the couple and the patient and then we select the embryo for transfer. The precise monitoring of embryo development is also very important in order to have a very fine-tuned approach for embryo selection. So IVF, this is typically the journey where it starts for a lot of couples who end up going for assisted conception. And this is one of the primary procedures that, as we know, is involved in uh, and offered in most fertility clinics. There are several stages of an IVF treatment. The first stage being ovarian stimulation or stimulating the ovaries with hormones or medications and expecting multiple follicles to grow in the ovaries. And during this follicular stimulation or ovarian stimulation, the patient has regular ultrasound scans to make sure that their follicles are growing um, as expected. Once the follicles have reached a certain size and are showing maturity, they will be, um, they, the, the eggs will be retrieved by a procedure called an egg collection. And again, the procedure is very straightforward. It takes about half an hour. The patient is sedated and a needle is passed through the vaginal wall and the follicle is then aspirated or all the follicles are aspirated and all the eggs are collected. On the same morning of the egg collection, the sperm is also prepared. So the male partner produces a sperm sample and the sperm will be prepared in the laboratory to, um, to clean the sperm and, and um, make it ready for fertilization. Then on the same afternoon, the sperm is inseminated with the eggs either by conventional IVF, if the sperm is of good quality, or sometimes we have to use ICSI called intracytoplasmic sperm injection, whereby the sperm parameters are quite poor. So whether you do IVF or ICSI, that is purely based on the sperm parameters. And of course, once we have inseminated the eggs and they have fertilized, then the journey involves continuous monitoring of those developing embryos or the, those fertilized eggs. And ultimately, after three to five days of embryonic development, we would then transfer one of these embryos back into the uterus and freeze the remaining embryos if they develop further. So ICSI we talked about, which is the method to inseminate the eggs in cases of severe male factor infertility. So typically, what does this mean? If sperm counts are less than 10 million sometimes, then we may choose to do ICSI as the procedure. So the initial stage of any decision making when it comes to the sperm and the method of insemination is to do a semen analysis. Once the semen analysis is done, whereby we ascertain the count, motility, morphology of the sperm, then we will discuss and decide whether we want to use conventional IVF as the method of fertilization or whether we want to use ICSI. And ICSI is the technique whereby we pick up a single sperm and inject it into the egg. In some men, the count of sperm could be very low, less than 1 million, which means X is the only uh, option. And in very few men, we could potentially find no sperm in the ejaculate, which means that they may need a bit more of a 
um, urological assessment by a consultant urologist to see whether they have any blockage in their um, in, in, in their reproductive tract, which is preventing the sperm from coming out in the ejaculate. And of course, if there is some form of blockage, or sometimes there is no blockage and yet no sperm, the urologist may consider doing a invasive procedure like a testicular biopsy, whereby a small biopsy is taken from the testicle and the sperm are retrieved from the testicle directly and used in ICSI. So Caroline, can you please just uh, play the next video, please, which is an ICSI video. So here we are, this is an egg that is held in place and you will see with the needle on the right hand side, you can see that there's a sperm in that needle and I'm going to be puncturing the egg and releasing the sperm in the middle of the egg. So there we are. <coughs> I'm just releasing the sperm in the egg. So that's how we perform ICSI or intracytoplasmic sperm injection. So in cases whereby we have either repeated miscarriage or something called high sperm DNA fragmentation, this is when men have a high abnormality rate with the sperm which is to do with the genetic material in the sperm head. So that is called DNA fragmentation. So when men have a high level of sperm DNA fragmentation, which can potentially result in a higher miscarriage rate, one of the treatment options that is recommended is called IMSI, which stands for Intracytoplasmic Morphologically Selected Sperm Injection, IMSI. And what we do with this technique, it's like ICSI, but we magnify the sperm to almost 1,000 to 6,000 times to see the level of detail in the sperm head, which can essentially give a much clearer picture of the health of the sperm. So you may see in this image there, these two pockets of air in that sperm called vacuoles, and ideally, we want to select sperm which do not have those vacuoles. So here we have another sperm, which is very clear, no vacuoles at all. There's a sperm here as well, no vacuoles. So we, we know that sperm with vacuoles are not good sperm to use. So hence, when embryologists magnify sperm to that degree, they may be able to pick sperm which are much healthy and have a much higher implantation potential from the embryos. So now I'm going to talk a bit about embryonic development. And we all know that the egg on the day of egg collection, the eggs are collected. As I said earlier, I said on the same day, we inseminate the eggs either by conventional IVF or ICSI. So on day zero, we've got the egg. And on day one, about 18 hours after insemination, we see normal fertilization. So here we are, we see two dimples sitting in the middle of the egg. That denotes normal fertilization. On day two, another 24 hours later, the embryo should be between two and four cells or two and five cells. On day three, about 72 hours after insemination, the embryo should be between six to 10 cells in development. And by day five, which is five days after egg collection, the embryo should be at the blastocyst stage, which, has, which, which is an embryo which has over 150 cells. And it is at this stage that ideally we would like to do the embryo transfer. So your embryologist is nurturing the embryos for about five days in their care in the laboratory in order to pick up information about which embryos have the best scope of implantation or the highest implantation potential. 
Embryo transfers can be done on day three or day five. However, by pushing embryo transfers to blastocysts, we give the patients a much higher chance of getting pregnant because we know that nature has its own funnels in terms of which embryos are going to make it to the blastocysts and which ones aren't. So to give you an example, um, we have a we, we may have five day three embryos but we would potentially only expect two of those embryos to make it to blastocysts so why do an embryo transfer on day three it's not needed simply because if you have a choice of embryos you might as well pick the best embryo because with embryos it's all about the survival of the fittest theory Embryos are going to go through this funnel. You will start off with a higher number of eggs. You will potentially have 70 or 80% of those eggs fertilized. You would potentially have about 60% of them make it to day three and potentially about 40 to 45% of those embryos to make it to day five. So it makes absolute sense to delay the embryo transfer to the blastocyst stage in order to give you the best chance of pregnancy. However, some clinics do a day three transfer because it helps them plan their weekend work. So you can imagine that if someone's had an egg collection on a Tuesday, this means that if they do a day five transfer, then the embryo transfer will be on a Sunday, which the clinic may not like doing because it needs to get all the staff in. So they may just do an embryo transfer on a Friday, which is day three. We all know that this is not necessarily giving the patient the best chance of a pregnancy, especially if the patient has got multiple good quality embryos available on day three. It makes absolute sense to wait to the blastocyst stage and select the best embryo for transfer. Because in that way, you have weeded out the embryos that are not destined to make it. So we also, as embryologists, we also take the decision of how many embryos to transfer very seriously in conjunction with our patients. We all know that transferring multiple embryos actually adds another layer of risk when it comes to multiple pregnancy and outcomes of a healthy baby. So in the UK, we have very strict guidelines in terms of when we transfer more than one embryo. And I know in most European countries nowadays, single embryo transfer is pretty much the norm. It's very rarely that we put multiple embryos back. And in the UK, I know we generally only put back two embryos if the patients are over 40 years of age. There are risks associated with multiple pregnancy and hence the decision to transfer multiple embryos should be taken very seriously. There is higher risk of miscarriage, there's potentially um, higher risk of premature delivery, etc. So um, it's very, very important that your clinical team and your embryologists make a, a very informed decision in conjunction with yourself when deciding on how many embryos to transfer. So you may ask what happens with the extra embryos that are created and the answer is that if you do have multiple blastocysts available we will freeze the remaining blastocysts for you so that you do not have to go through the whole process of egg collection again. So the good thing about um, embryo freezing is 90% of the embryos survive the freezing. Uh, the procedure is called vitrification, and this is a very new and novel way of preserving embryos, which results in very high success rates. The good thing is that the pregnancy rates with frozen embryos is the same as fresh embryos. And in fact, frozen embryo transfer cycles are becoming more and more popular in an IVF setting because it actually lowers a lot of the other risks, such as ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome for the patient. So a laboratory is a very complex area in any fertility clinic. 
Um, you can see uh, some of the images of what a lab looks like. So uh, in this image here, I'm sitting on a micromanipulator uh, performing an ICSI or an embryo biopsy. In this image here, you can see my colleague Serena. She is looking at some embryos uh, in, in a laminar flow cabinet, which has got a certain air quality that is going through it. In this cabinet, I'm preparing some sperm. This is typically the look of a laboratory internally. Um, in, we, we also have what we call a cryo room, whereby we store all the embryos in liquid nitrogen, and liquid nitrogen is minus 196. So again, we need a very dedicated vault for freezing and storing the embryos. So this is just some of the images of, of what a lab looks like. So let's then move on to discussing some of the finer innovations um, in the embryology laboratory, and one of them being assisted hatching. What assisted hatching is, it's making a small opening in the shell of the embryo. And you can see in this image that we have made the small opening with a laser beam. And this is generally done with a laser beam nowadays. It's very precise, it's very targeted, and we know that um, it, it's, it's pretty safe as well. So um, generally assisted hatching benefits women over the age of 40 because there's some level of indication that um, um, women over the age of 40 have a much harder shell around the embryos. So assisted hatching can give a much better chance of these embryos implanting. Even women with a higher follicle stimulating hormone level of more than nine can benefit. And of course, um, patients, if they've had a previous failed cycle, despite having good quality embryos, may also benefit from assisted hatching. So this is what I mean by applying very bespoke treatments by assessing the outcome of the patient or the history of the patient. I'm going to talk a bit about calcium activation as well, or something called calcium ionophore. So for those of for those patients who had a very low fertilization rate with ICSI, one of the problems that can be persistent is that there is not enough calcium uh, boost in, in, in the eggs. So by using a certain culture media, such as a calcium ionophore, we can increase the level of intracellular calcium so that the, the sperm starts doing its function and the egg realizes that it needs to start the events of fertilization. So typically we use the calcium ionophore in patients with a, at least with, with, with a poor fertilization rate of 30% or lower. Typically, as I said, we expect a fertilization rate of around 70 to 80 percent. So when fertilization rate with ICSI is lower, then we would recommend the use of a calcium ionophore. In some studies, we have also, uh, in some studies that has also seen that using calcium ionophore in patients who have had poor blastocyst quality or development also helps. And I must say my experience in this direction has been very positive. I have used calcium ionophore for very specific patients whereby they have had no previous blastocyst formation or very poor blastocyst quality. And using calcium ionophore in these patients has definitely given us a much better outcome, not only in terms of the number of blastocysts, but also the quality of the blastocysts. So one of the other things I want to talk about is actually sperm preparation. So the traditional methods of preparing sperm in a laboratory include using a centrifuge and to spin the sample down. But research has shown that when you spin the sample down, you can essentially induce some damage to the sperm. So there is a new method of sperm preparation called Zymod or microfluidic technology. And this, um, this technique is mainly aimed at uh, men who have got a high sperm DNA fragmentation. 
And the idea with using this technique is that the sperm are going to be passing through very, very narrow microfluidic channels so that the sperm that reach the other side are the most healthiest. Although the numbers will be much lower, but for the purpose of ICSI, whereby you need only a handful of sperm, it is worthwhile applying this technique to get the healthiest sperm on the other side, which can potentially can be a game changer for many patients going through IVF. So just to kind of show you some um, data around the use of zymote. So we know that when zymote is used, the sperm DNA fragmentation is very low um, after zymote compared to other methods like density gradient, centrifugation, or just a routine swim up. We also can see that from the graphs here, the fertilization rate with Zymox sperm is much better. And interestingly, the number of genetically healthy embryos is much higher with Zymox compared to what we call density gradient or centrifuge, using a centrifuge. <clears throat> and interestingly, of course, that sits hand in hand, but if you do have higher proportion of genetically normal embryos, you are likely to get a much higher pregnancy rate as well, which is what this paper showed. So one of the other advances in clinical embryology is the development of the embryoscope. What is the embryoscope? The embryoscope is an incubator that has got a camera in there. And whilst your embryos are incubating in a very physiological environment without them being taken in and out of the incubator to observe under the microscope, the camera is capturing all the information that we need it to capture. And usually there are images being taken every 15 to 20 minutes of the embryos as they develop. And this data capture or the amount of images that are recorded are played in the form of a video. And the embryologist, when they're ready to be selecting the embryos for transfer, will be playing these videos and comparing your embryos side by side in terms of the videos that are being played. And Based on how the embryos are developing, uh, the embryologist uses very specific algorithms or sometimes even artificial intelligence algorithms so that we can select the best embryo for transfer. So in the next slide, uh, Caroline, there will be a video, which if you can play, that'd be great. That shows the embryoscope development. So there we are two cells going to four cells, and there's a clock obviously on the side, so the embryologists are continuously timing the embryo. There's eight cells, 16 cells, morula, and soon there's gonna be the blastocyst. So there we are, the blastocyst is hatching out and it is ready to implant. So the embryologist plays these videos on all the embryos that you have culturing and based on what they see, what they like, what they don't like in these embryos, in, in, the, in these videos of the embryo development, they will select which embryo is the best one for transfer. And then this brings me to the last few slides, which is one of the major applications in the laboratory nowadays in most IVF units which is the application of genetics. So we know for a fact that one of the reasons why embryos do not implant or result in a miscarriage is because the embryos have genetic abnormalities. As I was saying in, in my earlier webinar today, when I was talking about miscarriages, one of the major problems with miscarriages is the genetic abnormalities. And many couples who go through IVF 
would of course not want to risk a miscarriage, but at the same time, they want to optimize the chances of getting pregnant too. So in order to do that, there is the technology of pre-implantation genetic screening, which enables us to exactly see what's happening at the embryo, at the genetic level. In terms of the statistics, I can tell you that 90% of the embryos that fail to implant or the embryos that result in a miscarriage are genetically or chromosomally abnormal. So what this powerful technology gives us is that information of which embryos are normal and healthy and which embryos are genetically abnormal. But for that, we have to take a small, a small biopsy from the embryos. And the way we take these biopsies is through a, a video that you'll see um, in, in the next slide, whereby we pull some cells away from the embryo. So the idea of the genetic testing is that when we get the report, it will exactly tell us which embryos are genetically healthy, which embryos have got aneuploides or have got genetic abnormalities. And of course, our focus then changes into just transferring the normal or genetically normal embryos back, which A, potentially gives a higher pregnancy rate to the couple and B, lowers the miscarriage rate as well in, in, in patients. So um, can we see the video, please, Karen? There we are. So this is an embryo which is nicely hatching out of its shell. And what I'm going to be doing there is I'm going to be taking a small biopsy of the embryo. And what you're going to see is on one part of the embryo, I've held it in place. And there we are. This is the ball of cells that makes the baby. And this is the layer of cells that makes the placenta. So we're just going to be take, pulling some cells. And I'm going to be applying a very, very low powered laser shot to remove some cells from the embryo. There we are. So I'm just loosening some of the cells by using a laser beam. And there we are, the cells are shearing off quite nicely and they have been taken away from the embryo. So that is an embryo biopsy. And of course, as a result of genetic testing, the embryos have to be frozen. They cannot be transferred fresh because the genetic results takes about a week to 10 days to get the results. So once the results are obtained, then we can plan an embryo transfer with the patients. That's the embryo itself. And you'll see the biopsy there as well. That's the biopsy of the cells that have been taken. Okay. Right, so we'll move on. And apart from just doing conventional pre-implantation genetic testing, we are also a center of excellence that does pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So um, when we see couples who have a known genetic condition that they carry, such as cystic fibrosis, breast cancer, thalassemia, muscular dystrophy, retinoblastoma, sickle cell anemia, Fanconi's anemia, there are many, many different types of genetic disorders that can affect couples and poses a higher risk of them transmitting that genetic abnormality to their children. So for these couples, although they may not be infertile, but there are options to have genetic testing of their embryos done to select the normal embryos from the abnormal embryos, especially if they're carrying a genetic disorder. So this is my last slide, why I'm with London. We are a very scientific, focused clinic. We uh, apply a lot of um, um, scientific advancements and developments into our day-to-day -day practices. Um, as I said, I'm a clinical embryologist, so I'm very passionate about wanting to make a difference in the outcomes of IVF cycle through innovation and science. 
And apart from that, we're also a very holistic clinic. We um, put a lot of emphasis on various holistic therapies like nutrition, reflexology, acupuncture. Um, we're based in Northwest London. So at this time, in, 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 at this COVID time, it's nice for our patients not to travel into central London. Uh, but yes, this is just a bit about us. And I leave you with that. And this is just our contact details. If anyone is keen to contact us, please do take note of our phone number, our email address, or our website address, or connect through our social media handles. Thank you so much. And wonderful. Thank you so much again for <laughs> thorough presentation. Indeed, as always, you have provided lots and lots of interesting things here. And of course, thank you for those videos that we could see how exactly it looks like. And as you can see, and you have questions are right here, so I guess we can uh, start with those questions, right, Dr. Alpesh? Yeah, sure. Um, Happy to hear this then. All right. Sure. And well, let me go to the very first question that we received right here. And it's right. Okay, here. Is the fertilization right better when using ICSI compared to IVF, even if there is no sperm issue? The answer is no. If there is no sperm issue, we, we should try and keep things as natural as possible and we should just use IVF rather than ICSI. So if the sperm is normal and healthy, I would not advise doing ICSI because the fertilization rates are the same. Very first question, and your answer to that. Next question What are the chances of a woman over 42 year old getting X? Is it best to donor X? That's a very good question, Angela. Um, generally, I would recommend that in women who are over 40, if they have a good ovarian reserve, then they should try with their own eggs. Although it's important to understand that at the age of 42, you're looking at around 8 to 10% of your eggs being chromosomally or genetically normal. So I would strongly advise that um, if you are going to be considering treatment with your own eggs, which there is no harm to if you've got a good ovarian reserve, you should combine the use of genetic testing on your embryos and if there is a genetically healthy embryo, your chances of getting pregnant with your own eggs could be as high as 70%. So don't lose focus of the fact that if you do have a genetically healthy embryo, you have a very good chance of getting pregnant. But of course, if you go through multiple cycles of IVF with genetic testing and there is no genetically normal embryo available, then you may take the call to move to donor eggs. All right. Again, thank you so much for your question and your answer to that and your advice, of course, as well. And of course, there's another question right here. I see many clinics offering ICSI as a standard. Is there any advantage to this where sperm analysis is good? So Karen, as I said earlier, uh, there is no advantage of doing ICSI if not indicated. So ICSI is purely indicated in men with a low sperm count or if there is a history of poor fertilization with conventional IVF. ICSI does not give any superior results if there is no indication. If anything, I want you to understand that ICSI has its own risks because by doing ICSI, we can potentially damage the egg as well. As you saw, ICSI involves passing a needle into the egg and not all eggs can sustain that trauma. So if there is no indication to do ICSI, i.e. the sperm is normal and healthy, I would suggest stick to the most physiological method, which is conventional IVF. Again, thank you so much for that. And as you can see, there is a thank you from Karen for you as well. Okay. And of course, there are more and more of those questions coming up. So next one is here. 
How important is the defrosting of the embryos and timing of transferring into the lining for good implantation? What is done for optimal success in preparing the lining and in turn for a healthy pregnancy and birth? So there's, ma there's, there's many things I want to kind of answer to this question. It's quite a heavy question. So in order to optimize the lining, Angela, it's very important to understand that, oh, other than PGD24, read my other question. Okay, sorry, can I have the other question, please? Okay, so um, in order to get the optimum lining, of course, this is a clinical um, avenue, but typically I would suggest that, you know, if your periods are regular, then you can just consider having a, what we call a short protocol, uh, whereby when I say short protocol, meaning on the second day of your period, you can start taking some estrogen tablets and after 12 days assessing the lining of, of, the, of, the, of the endometrium or the uterus. And then if the lining is over eight millimeters, you can start the progesterone. And usually on the sixth day of progesterone, you would have the blastocyst transferred. So um, of course, uh, adequate um, cycle monitoring is paramount when it comes to success rates and a healthy pregnancy and a live birth. But of course, the lab is also very important because the skill of the embryologist in defrosting the embryos and transferring the embryos is also important. Additionally, the skill of your clinician in transferring this embryo into the uterus is also very, very important. And once again, thank you for that. <coughs> All right, um, let's have a look at the next one. So can the ICSI procedure destroy the egg? The answer is yes, it can do, because some of the eggs are very, very fragile. In fact, in women of advanced age, the eggs can be very, very fragile. So by subjecting them to a needle, again, if it's not needed, is probably best avoided. ICSI, again, is only for severe male factor infertility. If there is no reason to do ICSI, ICSI should not be done because it can also have contraindications. And once again, thank you so much for explaining this to us. And let's have a look at the next one. So does the use of microsorting also check the sperm for any vacuoles? Is the use of this machine better than magnified visual observation only? It's a very good question, Karen. Um, microfluidic sperm sort sorting is a very, very new technique. Uh, IMSI, which is looking uh, for vacuoles in the sperm head, has been around for many years now, at least 12 years but the microfluidics is much better. So in my opinion, um, I would prefer to use microfluidics because um, with the imagery of looking for vacuoles in the sperm, it can be very hit and miss. Whereas hopefully by using a more, um, you know, robust method of identifying sperm with better DNA, such as microfluidic sorting, it will give a more concrete cohort of sperm that are better uh, in achieving fertilization and better embryonic development. All right, again, thanks for this question indeed, and of course your advice and help with that question. And so next one is, what is your opinion on Emberscope technology? Does it increase the chance of successful pregnancy? That's a very good question, and I always I, I feel I need to give a very responsible answer to this. So with a lot of this new technology and what we class as add-ons, because all these things cost money, and of course, you know, uh, if patients can avoid these costs, then why not? But I always think that the benefits of the embryoscope are that you do not have to remove the embryos out of the conventional incubator. Uh, the embryos are continuously kept in a more physiological environment and embryos are very, very temperature sensitive. So if you take them out, they can essentially face a slight trauma. But most importantly, um, I, I feel that that is one of the main reasons why I would like to use the embryoscope. 
But there are quite a few papers that are now suggesting that the intricate level of information that you get from the embryoscope can potentially aid in embryologists selecting or deselecting embryos for transfer. And if you do have a methodology or an algorithm which helps you deselect embryos for transfer, then of course it will translate into better success rates. So I know it's all kind of interdependent, but I would like to think that if um, the clinic has got good validated algorithms, then they will be seeing a much better outcome from using the embryoscope. All right, excellent again. Thank you so much for that. And let's have a look. Next question is how many mature eggs are needed for a 39 or 40 year old to get a day five blastocyst? Okay, so this is, um, it, 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 it's a bit of a difficult one to answer because if, you know, every 39 or 40 year old displays a very different output. But on average, I would say that um, we, to, to get a blastocyst, I would recommend to get at least 10 eggs. So I think the starting point, which is the number of mature eggs needed for a 39 to 40 year old to get a day five blastocyst, I think we should be aiming for about 10 eggs. Understood again perfectly. Thank you. For this. Okay, next question. Uh, which is the best media for pickup? Sorry, denudation and XC media with HEPES or without it? Now, it seems like that this question is being asked by a scientist rather than a patient. <laughs> <laughs> Which no, is this is probably true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I generally prefer using media with HEPES or a buffer if I'm working outside of the gaseous conditions. So uh, a lot of the for patients, this may not make sense, but um, in the embryology lab, we either work within a gas environment. If the embryos are in an incubator, then there is gases around it, which it absorbs to maintain the pH of the, uh, the media in which the embryos are growing. So um, the answer to this question is that um, I generally prefer using a media with a physiological buffer, such as HEPIs, when I'm doing ICSI and denudation. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much for, well, your question indeed, and your help with this indeed. All right, and um, what would you say is the normal packing of the embryos for, from sending to another clinic, I guess? So if you are going to be Presumably, this question is talking about how do you transport embryos from one clinic to the other, rather than how do you send the biopsy cells from the clinic to the laboratory. So I'll, I'll, I'll think, I, I, I would like to assume it's the first question that's being asked. So if, if it's being asked by a patient, then yes, the embryos are transported in liquid nitrogen. So we have specialized biological couriers that come and pick the embryos and are transported in what we call a dry shipper. The dry shipper has got liquid nitrogen in, in the periphery, which keeps the embryos in a very chilled and frozen state. So the embryos can be in this, um, in, in, in this interim phase where they're held at one, minus 180 to minus 196 degrees centigrade during the journey um, where they're being transported from one clinic to the other. And it can last for a few days because the dry shippers that are made nowadays are made to hold the temperature for around three to four days. So embryos are also sent between different countries nowadays, which can take, you know, 24, 48 hours sometimes to reach the destination. And this absolutely safe, pregnancies are reported, healthy babies are born. So um, nowadays moving embryos from clinic to clinic is a very, very common phenomenon. And once again, thank you so much for 
that. Um, okay. And sorry, just looking at the questions, of course, we have more and more of those. So let's have a look at the next one. So what is the survivor surviving rate of freezing eggs? Uh, does it vary with age? Good question there. Usually the survival rate of frozen eggs is around 86 to 90 percent. And the answer is yes, the survival rate does go down with age. Typically in women over 40, the survival rate can be as low as 70 percent. Wonderful. Thank you so much for this. And I'm sorry, actually, there is a follow-up, okay, from Angela from previous question, okay? So um, so here's what she added. No, not the biopsy. How are the embryos packed in the dry shipper? Uh, I'm asking because my clinic did not put protection caps on and they got lost in the cryo shipper. What? And we used a 21-day dry shipper and the receiving clinic was shocked as to how they were packed. Yeah, that sounds very radical, uh, Angela. Um, they should be packed in a very secure manner, of course. Um, you know, we, we, every clinic does it differently, but we use specialized canes in which the straws sit so that it's easy to retrieve them at the other end. So various clinics use different ways, but of course, it's basic common sense that, you know, embryologists at in every clinic should be using very, very robust techniques to make sure that the integrity of the embryos is maintained so that they have to use the right techniques to package the embryos. All right, thank you so much. And actually another follow-up, okay, from Angela. So let me just go straight to that. So I was told by the receiving clinic that then tell them to that they can't ship biological material without protection caps. So they need to attach first a uh, viso tube to the metal cane and all the cryo straws must be inside and they need to put up the side second viso tube as a cap. That's usual, usual security protocol for everyone. That's correct, Angela. That is absolutely right. I totally agree with what the clinic have told you. This is exactly how we package the straws when we transport them to another clinic. All right. Thank you so much for confirming <laughs> this to us as well. Um, okay. Next question is, so can assisted hatching happen at any stage of blastocyst? Assisted hatching is usually carried out on day three of embryonic development. But yes, there is no reason why it cannot be done on day two or day four or even day five. It really depends on the protocols used in individual laboratories. But yes, in theory, the whole idea is making a small opening in the shell of the embryo so that the embryo has an escape route to implant. Excellent. Thank you so much. Once more. And next question is, good evening. Thank you for your lecture. I would like to know if IVF London does take trainee students and if so, how to apply. Hi, Cassandra. Thank you so much for your interest. Um, we're a very small clinic. At the moment, we are not accepting any trainees. We uh, have already got two trainees that we're training. So we've got a bit of our hands full when it comes to training clinical embryologists. But um, I would inquire in another year. And my, my suggestion to you is uh, you do write to all the clinics, of course, in London. And I'm sure um, some of the larger centers have continuously got vacancies to train students. All right, thank you so much for that. And of course, Cassandra, thank you so much for your question, indeed, as well. Um, all right, next question is also right here. So what is the state success rate of oocyte in vitro maturation? So in vitro maturation is a very, um, it, it's not a very advanced technique in its current state. Uh, most clinics are not offering in vitro maturation at this point because uh, the success rates are, are quite low. Uh, we as a clinic do not offer in vitro maturation. Um, of course, it's, it's got very limited benefit in patients with polycystic ovaries. That's the only patient population that it can actually uh, assist with. However, um, you would only do in vitro maturation because you're trying to prevent any ovarian hyperstimulation in these patients. But nowadays, with the better stimulation regimes, mild stimulation, 
there's hardly an event of ovarian hyperstimulation. And hence, in vitro maturation is something which is really not um, utilized in clinical practice. All right. Once again, thank you so much for your question. And actually, there is a follow-up, okay, from the very same patient. I have heard that a child was born this year through IVM. Anything you can write? This has not been the first IVM baby. There have been many babies born around the world through in vitro maturation. It's not to say that successes are not, not being reported, but when I say success rates are minimal, is when you compare the technology to others. So for example, take, you know, if, if you compare IVF with fully mature eggs compared to in vitro matured eggs, an IVF with mature eggs has a much better outcome. Uh, but yes, success is not necessarily, you know, having a baby born is not necessarily a measure of um, the statistical success rate that we're talking about. Okay, indeed. Thank you so much then for this explanation. And there's a thanks from the patient here as well. Um, next question. Let me have a look. So is there any age limit for treatment in your clinic? Uh, yes, there is an age limit. We have gone up to 45 with treating patients with their own eggs. So uh, it's not to say that if we get a 46 year old, we will not, um, you know, uh, we will not consider. The most important thing is not necessarily the age. The most important thing is the ovarian reserve. So even if the patient is 46, but if they have a good ovarian reserve, we will potentially consider offering them treatment. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, and next question. It's right here. So what are the chances that things go wrong in a pregnancy with PGD-24 tested proven donor into a good surrogate mother who's had her own children already? Is there an ideal time one should wait and any minimum and maximum years between the birth of her own children? No, I don't believe that there is any data that says that. Uh, but I, I would say that, you know, it just makes logical sense that whilst the surrogate has had her own child, and if she's breastfeeding, then of course, uh, planning another pregnancy is not on the agenda. I would say that once, um, I, I would give it a year after the baby is born, um, provided she stopped breastfeeding for at least six months um, before she embarks onto a treatment for yourself or being a surrogate. Now, you also ask the question, what can go wrong? Now, it's important to understand that, um, PGD tested embryos for all the chromosomes doesn't necessarily mean that there is a hundred percent implantation rate. So one of the things that can go wrong is that the embryo may simply not implant. There is a 70% chance that these embryos will implant, but not 100. So you've got a 30% odds that the, the cycle may not work, the embryo may not, may not implant. All right. Once again, thank you so much for your question and, of course, your assistance again. Um, as you can see, there are a few questions left. So, of course, we will be slowly finishing. So, if you have any questions left, this is your time to go ahead and type those in. As we will be slowly finishing, this is like a final call. Okay, so don't miss your chance. And the question is, so what is the age limit? So if you could repeat, because I believe you've mentioned that, will you treat someone of 51 with a donor egg? So in the UK, there is no regulation when it comes to upper age limit. It's generally just good practice guidelines. So um, as a clinic, if you have a egg donor uh, available, um, at the moment, the biggest shortage in the UK is finding egg donors. So the answer to your question is, yes, we will treat someone who is 51, provided they have an egg donor they can bring along with them. And once again, thank you for your question. Let me have a look. Next question is right here. At what stage you do assisted hatching and do you make a complete hole in the zona or just a partial hole with an inter inter internal layer in zona as you showed in one of your slides? So yes, Azar, I, I make a complete opening when I do assisted hatching. I make a channel 
um, of a, a channel uh, opening which totally breaches the zona. I do not like zona thinning or anything like that. I just make a complete opening. And and I do. It says, "What stage do you do assisted hatching?" I do it on day three. And thank you. Sorry, once again, I'm right here. Of course, don't worry. Um, can we just have a look? Okay, next question is up. Can we trust PGTA in 100%? I mean, there are no mistakes. What is the possibility to destroy an ember during the biopsy? So there is no procedure that is 100% firstly, Beata. You know, um, PGTA has a 97% accuracy, I believe. So there is still uh, a, a margin of error. The results that you get are as accurate as technology has made it out to be at the moment. But there are still um, kind of pitfalls when it comes to any kind of technology. And one of the limitations that we have with genetic testing is that there's something called mosaicism, whereby some embryos may have a mixture of normal and abnormal cells. Um, and when embryos are mosaic, their true um, implantation potential is a bit unknown. It then depends on the level of mosaicism they have. So unfortunately, nothing is 100%. Um, of course, errors can happen. You know, an error can happen at biopsy. Error can happen at, uh, in, the, in the lab that does the genetic testing, et cetera, et cetera. But there is very robust protocols in place, double witnessing in place to make sure errors don't happen. And your last question about does a biopsy not destroy the embryo? It's all about skill. It is an invasive procedure. As you saw in the video as well, we're, we're slicing off some cells of the embryo. So it is an invasive procedure. And if the skill is there, then the embryo doesn't feel the trauma. But if it's a more, um, if, if the skill is not there, then yes, the embryologist can totally damage the embryo. All right. Once again, thank you so much for your question and, of course, your help with this. And let me have a look. So I see comments, claims about labs being very good or not. How is it possible to tell? What should I be looking for or asking? Is it mainly down to the scale of the embryologist or other factors that can create such a difference? I think ultimately, Karen, the proof is always in the pudding. So, the, the, you know, rather than and I, I and I don't think many labs would potentially allow you to see the the, the labs they, they may do, but it's also asking the right questions. And I don't think um, what I'm trying to say is I I'm not saying that you, you you need to have a series of questions for them to figure out whether that lab is good. Ultimately, it would be reflected in their success rates. So it doesn't matter how they do things, but as long as the success rates are good in your age group when you have done some comparisons, you will automatically know which clinics run a sound, uh, so sound level of practice. And that is very important because it doesn't matter how they do it, as long as they get the success rates, that's the most important thing. And you will know for a fact, once you start looking at success rates of different clinics in your age group to understand which clinics are a bit more superior even in their practices. All right. Once again, thank you so much for your question. Um, okay. And let's have a look. So in cases of dense and thick zona, do you recommend assisted hatching before freezing, partial or complete hatching? Okay. So I generally prefer doing assisted hatching when I thaw the embryos. So I would not freeze, uh, I, I would not do the assisted hatching prior to freezing. I would do the assisted hatching on thawing, a complete hatching. So not partial, complete. Okay, understood. Thank you so much for that. And let's have a look at the next question. So how, any, how and why does a high BMI impact egg quality and does unexplained infertility, infertility really exist? Surely there must be a problem, otherwise the couple would conceive. 
You're right. I mean, uh, unexplained infertility is a simple way of everyone putting their hands up and saying, you know, we, we haven't found a reason. There's only so much you can investigate a couple. Um, and fortunately, treatment nowadays supersedes the level of investigations you do because ultimately investigations cost money too. So unexplained, you're, you're right in thinking that is there anything like unexplained infertility? It's simply the clinic's way of saying, well, we haven't found a cause, so let's label it unexplained infertility. Because if you keep on digging more and more, yes, you will get to the bottom of what that unexplained infertility is, and it's no longer unexplained. But your question about how does <coughs> BMI impact egg quality? BMI can potentially impact um, on pregnancy rates and, and potentially increase miscarriage rates. Uh, it can also affect egg quality because with higher weight, the reach of the hormone to stimulate the eggs could be compromised. And these women may need much higher doses of uh, gonadotrophins or hormones to stimulate their ovaries. Thank you so much again for that. And uh, let's have a look. Next question is also right here. So when using a sperm donor is a may MOT of 10 plus okay, or does having a higher number make a big difference? No, MOT 10 is absolutely fine, Maria. You don't have to go for a MOT 20. Um, MOT 10 is absolutely fine for IVF. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for that. And of course, there's a thanks from Maria right here. And how long does defrosting of an embryo take? Defrosting of an embryo takes around 20 minutes, but after defrosting, you have to leave it for about two hours in culture media before transferring the embryo. So all in all, in terms of clinical practice, it's about a two and a half hour process, whereby it takes 20 minutes to defrost and then around two hours to keep in your incubator before that embryo is transferred back into the uterus. All right, understood. Once again, thank you so much for that. And let me have a look. Um, okay, next question is, so quite often you hear that, I'm sure. What supplements would you recommend to improve number of quality? I, mean, I wouldn't want to comment on that simply because you would probably need to see a nutritionist for that. As embryologists, we would not be knowing what nutritional supplements that you take can affect embryo quality. I would suggest that you do seek an opinion of an expert nutritionist. Um, you know, some, uh, I mean, of course, folic acid is very, very important, but more than folic acid nowadays, the nutritionists recommend folate. Vitamin D is also quite important. So I think seeing a nutritionist will give you a more concrete and um, thorough answer in terms of recommending what supplements you should be taking. All right, thank you so much for this question, of course, and your help with this. And next one is right here. I'm considering to take an embryo frozen by a slow freezing method. Which chances does such an embryo have to survive the thawing? If it survives, does it have less potential to implant? So, a slow frozen embryo has got a lower survival chance than a vitrified embryo. We know that. So typically, uh, the statistics are that with slow freezing, around 80% of the embryos survive, depending on the stage at which it's frozen. And with uh, vitrification, 98% of the embryos survive uh, generally. So yes, you do have a bit of a, uh, a difference there in terms of survival rates. And again, the pregnancy rates can also be lower with slow frozen embryos compared to vitrified embryos. All right, again, thank you so much for that. Um, next question is, so what do you think about eggs banking for older women? The 
quality of the eggs is going to be the quality of the eggs when they are frozen. So to, to give an answer to that question, so yes, egg freezing can be done at any age in theory. And the sooner you do it, the better. If, if the concern is that you want to use it for fertility preservation. And um, if you are 40, you're better off freezing eggs when you're 40 rather than you're 42. However, it would be better to consider freezing when you're 35 rather than 40. So the quality of the eggs is going to be the quality at the time of freezing. So what's important to understand that if you do freeze your eggs when you are say 30 or 35, your chances of getting pregnant with those eggs at the age of 40 is going to be much higher than your eggs at 40 years of age, if that makes sense. All right. So once again, thank you so much for that. Um, okay. Next question. So how easy is it to find an egg donor? Um, there are agencies that can help you, Sarah, to find an egg donor, and there is a couple of UK-based agencies. If you are uh, looking for an egg donor, I would suggest get in touch with us. We do have, um, you know, contacts in, in, in that direction that we can, can put you in touch with, and these agencies will find you an altruistic egg donor. Mm -hmm. Understood, of course. Thank you so much. And if you can provide us with the cost for an ICSI at your clinic. Um, it's very variable. Um, when I say variable, I mean that the whole treatment cost is very variable depending on what package you are going to be prescribed by your doctor. So um, I wouldn't like to put a cost to it. Of course, all the costs are on our website. Our full price list is on there as well. But if I just give a figure right now, it is inaccurate because everything has to be packaged in together with the whole IVF cycle. So typically, just to give you a ballpark figure, uh, an IVF cycle with all the drugs, with ICSI, etc., will cost about seven and a half thousand. That is including all the drugs, all the blood tests, all the, um, uh, all the procedures, the egg connection, the ICSI, etc. Of course, understood once again. Thank you so much for that. What is what is better in use, uh, biopsy, the biopsy media, or the buffer solution? What is better in use, biopsy, the biopsy media? Uh, the embryos have to be biopsied in biopsy media. If, if that's what this question is asking. What is better in use, biopsy, the biopsy media, biopsy in the biopsy media, or the buffer solution. No, um, you have to em you have to biopsy the embryos in embryo biopsy media. The buffer is used to wash the cells before tubing. All right. Okay. Understood. Of course. Thank you for this. Um, next question is: So, can you give us good examples of the success rates when considering clinics for those in the forty-two plus group? Group. Yes. So it is important, uh, Vanessa, that when you are looking at clinics, it's important to ask them what their success rates are for patients in your age group. Please do not look at overall success rates of the clinic because comparing the age group of 35 to 38 is almost pointless. You, you want to make sure, I, I've known clinics, Vanessa, that have a very high success rate in older women, simply because they have a much tailored stimulation regime, such as mild stimulation. I mean, for example, at IVF London, we treat a lot of women with mild stimulation. Our average age is 38, 39, meaning we get a lot of older women as well come through. And we see a phenomenal success rates in older women, simply because we combine mild stimulation with genetic screening of embryos as well, which gives us a much higher success rate. So the answer is that look at your specific age group when you're comparing statistics between clinics. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And uh, if you can tell us what is a mild simulation? 
Mild stimulation is when you're not using the conventional high doses. So typically, um, the doses of stimulation can be anything from 150 units to 450 units. And at IVF London, we generally use mild stimulation, which is 150 to 225 units. We generally do not increase the dose more than two to five, which in our experience gives us better quality eggs. Once more, thank you so much for explaining this one as well. And next question is a bit uh, longer, so sorry. Oh, yeah. I no, have to check how many more questions we have because I yes, of okay. course we will be finishing. There are like three questions I believe okay. left, so of course uh, let's okay answer those three questions. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, if we have any more questions, we will simply forward do those to you so that you can help all the patients. Okay, is that okay? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Oh, so yeah. this is one of those three questions. Sorry, I have not looked a lot into assisted hatching so much, and I understand that hatching happens after blastocyst stage. I had a cool, good quality and tested day five embryo transfer that did not implant. I appreciate there could have been many reasons for this, although wondering if assisted hatching could have helped, and would you suggest this for further treatment? So assisted hatching is a is a very um, even from our regulators it's considered to be what we call an add-on, which means that there is limited evidence to prove its uh, its its benefit. So clinics that I use if if they use it they either use it because they get good results from it, but it's important to understand that it's not a proven technology when it comes to um, improving success outcomes. Um, I feel that if you have had a, a blastocyst transfer um, with a failed implantation, which didn't result in a um, pregnancy, and if that wasn't hatched, then what I would do is in the next cycle, I would certainly consider assisted hatching. But again, this is really individual to the clinic. Um, they may not even have it in their protocols to do assisted hatching. They may say that there is no evidence for it. So it really depends on their belief and their ethos of, of um, applying these techniques. Um, I am of the opinion that if, or certainly what I do in my lab, is if a patient has had a failed IVF cycle with a good quality embryo, I would consider assisted hatching in the following cycle. All right. Again, thank you so much. Mm, okay, the second question from those three I've mentioned will be this one. So, how long could frozen embryo can, can be saved? And 10 years or more? In theory, a frozen embryo can be stored indefinitely, in theory. But the law of this land allows patients to freeze embryos for 10 years. And if there is any compelling reasons whereby the couple or the individual can lose their fertility, then the law may allow for a further extension on those embryos. But by law, it's 10 years at the outset. And if there is any compelling reasons to extend storage, um, then you may be allowed to extend for another 10. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you so much once more for your question and, of course, your explanation. And, well, I believe this will be our final question for today. But, of course, any questions that are like three uh, that haven't been answered, we will simply forward to Dr. Alpesh and he will get back to you. Okay? Will that be fine for you as well? Yeah, sure. Happy to hear this then. So the question is... Um, What's your advice if we have result that most of our embryos has have abnormal abnormalities in the result of genetic diagnosis? What is your advice on that? So, if the embryos have genetic abnormalities, then we would not consider them for transfer at all. If the embryos are mosaic, meaning that there is some normal cells, some abnormal cells then we need to look at these embryos a bit further. What are the mosaic chromosomes affected uh, and whether it's, um, it's safe enough to do a transfer. But of course, whenever you are going to be considering transferring a mosaic embryo back into the patient, you need to have, the patient needs to have genetics counseling. And of course, uh, the clinic needs to be 
having very robust protocols to ensure that they have got um, they have covered all the possible scenarios uh, because it is an added layer of risk. And once again, thank you so much for uh, your advice, your recommendation to this one. And as I mentioned, this will be like final question, okay? But of course, there are like three questions left, of course. So don't worry, I will forward them to Dr. Alpes so that he can get back to you uh, via email address. And of course, um, I believe that will be fine for you as well. Maybe and there's only three, should we just go yeah? through them? Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah. so let's go ahead with the three ones, yeah. okay? Yeah. There are like quite short ones, but um, sure. I guess we can still go ahead. So how many embryos are needed for a 39 and a half years old woman? You see, it, it, it's very, it, 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 it's a very, we, we don't have specific algorithms for a 35 year old, 37 year old, 39 year old. Uh, generally, as I said, to get a good outcome, a clinic would say you would need to have at least 10 eggs. So some women don't have the ovarian reserve to be making 10 eggs after even one stimulation. So these women may have to consider batching of embryos in order. So they may have to go through multiple cycles of IVF to collect the right number of embryos. So um, again, my answer would be, you know, let's aim for at least 10 eggs. Okay, once again. Thank you so much for that. Next question is, how long is the waiting time to get an appointment in your clinic? Um, the waiting time is around three weeks at the moment to get a consultation appointment. Um, but we sometimes do get last minute you know, uh, changes, so we can accommodate within a week or so. Uh, but generally, as a rule, it's be be between uh, two to three weeks to get an initial consultation appointment. Wonderful, thank you so much once more. Next question, so when you mentioned that low stims allow for better quality, can I take from this that the medication can damage the eggs? Absolutely, Karen, the medication, which is the hormones that we give you, are very unphysiological doses. In your body, the doses are very small when, when eggs are made. So when we give you very unconventional doses, such as very high stimulation, that does have an impact on the quality of the eggs. So a lot of recent um, literature has shown that very high stimulations can be damaging on egg, egg, egg and embryo quality, of course. So in my opinion, yes, the answer is yes, that very high doses of medications can be damaging. All right. And yes, definitely. It has been our final question. So thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for all the questions. I do believe it has been very, very useful. And actually, I am sure it has been very useful for all of you. And Dr. Alpash, of course, you have been brilliant, as always. As you can see, lots of thanks for your assistance. And you can see those right here. Thank you, Professor Arfa Alpesh. Thank you very much for your informative webinar and all the answers to the questions. Thank you so much. And well, I Pleasure. can only ask, is there anything else you would like to add? No, thank you. It's been absolutely a pleasure to speak to all of you. And I'm, I'm really, really glad that patients are developing such an insight into asking the right questions. Um, and most importantly, it's nice to see that uh, patients are very engaging when it comes to the embryology aspects of IVF. And keep that going, of course, you know, it's, it's important that your clinic is transparent, your clinic uh, talks to you about everything that happens, um, whether that's in the lab or whether that's clinically. And it's very, very nice to know that patients are um, really at the forefront of the information provision. That's lovely to lovely to know. And actually, there is that is very lovely to to have you back with us. Okay, and uh, as always, it's been a pleasure to have you here. So thank you so much. And as I just want to mention to everyone that, of course, it has been recorded. So if anyone missed any part of that, remember you will be able to find the recording 
tomorrow on our website, myivfenses.com. And of course, it will be uploaded on our YouTube channel. So go ahead and subscribe. That way you will know where uh, when the video is uploaded. And as always, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, for spending this time with us as well. Uh, it's getting really late, I know. <laughs> so I know, Dr. Alpes, is, you are quite... Um, tired i'm sure it's been a long day for you it's a long monday but thank you so much for joining okay it's always always a pleasure so i just hope we will have another webinar pretty much soon with you thank you thank you caroline lovely to meet you all um stay safe stay healthy thank you of course thank you so much everyone have a lovely evening and remember we will be back tomorrow at 8 p.m uk time there is another topic and there are two special guests tomorrow so just don't miss this chance and go ahead and uh, register for our next webinar if you haven't already, of course. Thank you so much and take Thank care, you. everyone. Bye. Bye.